Good morning. Glad to have everyone this morning. If you are a visitor, we do have a guest register in the rear of the church, if you'd please sign your name. Um, we welcome Pastor Fred Girdwood again this morning as our guest pastor and his wife Rita is with him. Happy Father's Day. We'll have a little more on that in a few minutes, too. Um, things happening this week in your bulletin you have down that today is the newsletter deadline if you have anything you want put in the newsletter you need to leave a note for Becky or you could send her an email so she has it at the church's email and then she'll have that that way too um, the newsletter team will meet on at 10 30 a.m. on Thursday yeah I think so um, and Friday, the youth is planning to have a work day, mission kind of work day. They're going to be doing some work for a couple of our members. And um, if you're interested in doing that and don't haven't heard the details or need to know more about it, you can talk to Lynn Coors or maybe Aaron Crouch, too. And they can fill you in on the details. They will be working, start planning on starting at 9 a.m. and working the whole day. And then um, the Glass family has volunteered to have them come to their house afterwards for a meal and a swim party. So it should be a fun, a fun and useful day, purposeful day. So. Oh yes, they are supposed to bring a sack lunch. So that's the plans for that. Um, we are tentatively planning to have a prayer service next Sunday at 7 p.m. If you have any suggestions or ideas about how you think that should go, um, talk to Larry Cassidy. And we're kind of in the dark as to how to go about doing that without a pastor to lead the way. <laughs> so, um, and um, next Sunday. Yeah, next Sunday, is that right, the 26th? Oh, Monday. The Women's Guild will have a business meeting at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. So that's a week from tomorrow. I'm getting ahead of everything here, but I just saw that and I thought maybe it was next Sunday. But that's right, the 25th is. I'll get it straight in a minute. Um, also, on we have some birthdays this week and an anniversary. Tomorrow is Martha Keller's birthday. Happy birthday, Martha. And Tuesday is Amy Coon's birthday. Um, Wednesday is Bill Coon's birthday. Friday is Dylan Harker's birthday. Saturday is Joe Harker's birthday and Cameron Coon's birthday. And Matt and Amy Coon have an anniversary. Are there any others that I don't know about or? We've tried to update the list, but our list, but sometimes maybe everybody didn't learn that or know to put those in. Um, and are there any other announcements? Yes. Marvin? Okay. Zion Hammers meet up here in front after church today. Um, any others? Janet? I heard Nancy Coon. That's, yeah, she is on the prayer list. Um, but she had a serious fall and she'll be at uh, Morristown Rehab for two or three weeks. So I want to make sure we pray for Nancy. Um, has Lillian made it to California safely, Barb? Barb, did Lillian? Okay, good. Um, if there aren't any other announcements, Deborah Adams would like to talk a little, has a special announcement. Happy Father's Day to all, everyone. I wanted to do something a little different today. I wanted to start off with a beautiful card that Keith Loveless gave to his father and I think it starts everything off really well. It says, Dad, thanks for teaching me what really matters. There are a lot of things you taught me without ever saying a word. You taught me to do what's right, 
by living your life with integrity. You taught me to be kind by always caring so much about others. And my whole life, day by day, you taught me how to love by loving me with your whole heart. Happy Father's Day with love. And he even signed it himself. <laughs> the wife didn't sign it for him. <laughs> As so often happens on those cards. So thank you for sharing this. And I'll make sure it gets back. And I won't ask Keith to come forward because he will suddenly have to get up and go to the restroom or something like that. You know. Uh, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring about maybe five different ones. And I wanted you to either, I'd like for you to come forward because I want you to tell me your memory of your father. Whether he's still here, whether he's not here, but something to honor him on Father's Day. Okay? I'm going to start off with... Why don't you start? Okay, all right. Okay, I'll start. Then I'm going to go to you. Okay, okay. so you got, you got 30 seconds. Okay, okay. Debbie? Okay. One of my favorite um, memories of my dad was the fact of his work ethic. The other was, he always made sure that we had enough. We never knew what we missed. You didn't, you didn't miss what you never had in life. And uh, his laughter. I miss his laughter and his sense of humor. And being able to tease and to, to do that more than anything. And we would have long talks and my mother would go to home at club meetings and Yvonne would there be with her. My father and I would sit down for two and three hours later from when I was a teenager on and have these long conversations. And I miss that more than anything. So, all right, Debbie. Can I stay here? Yep, you can stay right there. Well, I know a lot of you, as Deborah's father, if some of you don't know, her father was John David Coon's brother and um, went to this church all of his life and his parents before him and maybe grandparents too went to church here for, so they go way back. My father was one of those also. Um, my father was a Hale and a lot of you knew him. He taught Sunday school class for many years and was very loved as I understand from his students as the Sunday school teacher of the young adults at that time. And uh, but my favorite memory as a family, I guess, my dad loved the Ohio River. So often on Sunday afternoons, mom might get up on Sunday morning and fry up chicken. We'd pack a picnic lunch and head to the Ohio River, usually Madison, because that was kind of the quickest place to go, closest. And we'd stop at a roadside table along the way and eat our picnic lunch, which you don't see those anymore. You have rest areas off the interstates, but the county two-lane highways and all that, you don't see the picnic baskets or air tables. But that's kind of my favorite memory that maybe some of you that knew him didn't know, but that was one of his things. He liked to look at the Ohio River, especially if it was flooding. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask you to do something because I'm going to have everyone that come up here. I have a little gift for the men, so I'm going to ask you to take and pass one of these out to each one of the men. So you're going to have five here. Uh-huh. Okay. Let's ask, uh, how about Donna? Yeah, come on. Well, um, my dad was um, in the banking business, and I can remember going to the bank and going into his office and then eventually being uh, back behind the teller's cage getting a sucker and, <laughs> oh, I'd run in the vault or whatever, and that was okay then. But um, the main thing that I, I remember about my dad is that he was in a wheelchair in, for about 16 years, and, um, but he never felt sorry for himself. He was always, um, oh well, this is the way life is, and you just adjust. And things that he couldn't do anymore after he couldn't walk, he just found other things that he could do. And um, I just remember always looking, um, 
feeling privileged that he felt that way because then that made me look be that way growing up that um, I always looked to the bright side and didn't feel sorry for myself if something didn't go my way. Thank you so much for sharing that. Do you mind passing these out? Yeah, just go ahead and just pass them out to whoops, find, a, find a guy out there. Yeah, find a man. <laughs> go find yourself a guy out there. Patty Higgins. <laughs> Come on, Patty. Please. Are you comfortable talking? You want to do it from where you are? If not, Gary will talk. Pass it off to Gary. <laughs> hey, take it up with your sister. <laughs> Yeah, as um, many of you know, our families have been in this church a long time as well. And, and my father was a dairy farmer, John's father, and dairy farmer also. And those are hard days, long, long days. And I can remember it was a special treat for us to go somewhere distant because you always had to be home at, to do the milking at the end of the end of the day. So two or three times a, a year, we'd usually go to a state park somewhere. And once in a while, we wouldn't be getting the milking done until about nine o'clock. But these are things that I remember about the things that they did for us. And also, you know, taking time at the end of the day to go swimming, to try to teach us to swim. I was a failure, but <laughs> the others learned, I think. Take one for yourself. Pass them out to some of the other guys. Oh, gotcha. Okay. How about Judy? Yep. In the way back there. And next will be, I think our last one will be Bryce. <laughs> Bring that little boy of yours up with you, too. <laughs> My father... Uh, was a carpenter. Uh, he he worked very very hard. Can you hear me? And we also lived on a farm. And he was a very outdoorsy type person. He hunted, fished, you know, he all kinds of hunting. And I remember him taking me with him so many times. We uh, went mushroom hunting, uh, squirrel hunting, fishing. He deer hunted and just all sorts of things. Squirrel hunting. I remember on our garage in season, he would hang the squirrel tails. So to keep ta track of how many squirrels he'd killed that season. But uh, he was a very, very hard worker. And uh, you say your senses... One of the senses I have of him is the smell of sweat. So, uh, you know, that's how hard of a worker he was. And uh, I, you know, I think of him often. He's been gone a few years now. Bryce, you gonna come forward, bring that? He's a new dad, yeah. <laughs> Makes today extra special. <laughs> All right, Dad. <laughs> you want? Do you want? You want to talk? Yeah. You can talk now. I know I told you we gotta be quiet in church, but you can talk now. Say hi. Say Dad. Um, my uh. The, the greatest thing that my dad ever gave me was uh, the, the lesson of hard work, the, the ability to work, and uh, that, that there is no quit until something's done, and if you don't have time to uh, do it right the first time, you better have time to do it right the second time. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I love the honor. I, I have the privilege, I guess, of being the one that uh, got up here to talk that still has my dad here today. 
um, and the the great the great privilege to uh, to raise my son. Still uh, still having him around as a mentor and and my grandpa as well. Uh, and the uh, the way the way they are around Bryant and and uh, the examples they set for me. So, do you want to say anything? You like you like that I buy you cows, don't you? There you go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I think if you ha did not receive a gift, please raise your hand. Abby, can I get you to help me pass these out? All right. And then we're going to make sure everybody has it. Has one. John David too, I think John too over there. John. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Maybe that got everybody thinking of some nice memories of their fathers, and even if you didn't get the chance to say something up in the balcony, Deborah. Up in the balcony didn't so send Abby could go up up in the balcony maybe okay um, are there any other announcements that someone thought of or anyone that we should pray for any other prayer concerns yeah Fred uh, Okay, yes, please sign up, or even if you don't get signed up, come and help. <laughs> we'll find something for you to do. Okay, um, if there isn't anything else, we'll take a few moments to pray for those on our prayer list and any others that you might know of. And let's add, add a special prayer for our church as we venture through this journey of finding a new pastor and kind of being in a in-between situation right now. And so if you want to have silent prayer for a few minutes to meditate and pray for these people. Amen. And now please stand for our call to worship. It's a responsive reading on your bulletin and on the screens. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Yeah. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise God's name. God's love continues to touch our lives this very day as we worship here, giving us strength and wisdom for the days before us. And our opening hymn is on page 72, To God Be the Glory.
if you'll remain standing and join me in our statement of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was dead. He descended into heaven. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended in heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And I guess I might have gotten ahead of myself on the recognition of fathers. <laughs> but, okay, so we'll go on to our gathering prayer. You may be seated before we do that. In unison, God of our fathers, whose almighty hand reaches out to grasp our lives and bless us, God of power and majesty, lay your claim on our lives as you call us your beloved children. Bless us as we worship here. Nurture us in your holy word. Empower us with your Holy Spirit. Help us see that our time in worship this morning is a launching pad, a launching pad for ministry as you call us to live in and transform this world according to your love. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Huh? Okay. <laughs> I can't read ahead, I guess. Lynn says we're supposed to do the sermon hymn first, so we will sing the sermon hymn, which is on page 732. And now 
we'll have the scripture reading, which is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pastor Girdwood. How many great-grandfathers do we have here this morning? All right. You know, when I was a father first, my kids used to say that I was pretty great. And so when I had grandchildren, I was already a great-grandfather. How many, how many grandfathers do we have here this morning? Yeah. How many fathers do we have here this morning? Now here's the biggie. How many sons do we have here this morning? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, if, if you're a grandfather or father, yeah, you're a son, absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes we wrestle through life not knowing exactly what it is that God wants us to do. Now, there are some scriptures that are given that tell us things about what fathers are supposed to do. They're supposed to train up their children in the way of the Lord, and help them come to the Lord, and help them understand things about the Lord. And as was demonstrated by some of the, the things people have shared with us this morning about how their fathers set examples for them, it's, it's important for us to learn the facts of life. The things of life that help keep us going in life. My father died at the ripe old age of 94, and I don't remember how many years that ago that was. Uh, Dad and mom started out having three children, and then they waited for a dozen years and had us three younger children. I'm in the middle of, of those younger children. But uh, Dad was born at the farm the, the, the farm the family had. His dad had started this farm and added a lot of acreage to it. And, and that's back in the day when uh, 400 acres was a lot of farm. <laughs> and uh, dad then, in the course of years, sold off part of the farm on one corner there to a, a neighbor by the name of Mr. Washburn. And Washburn gave a corner of that little piece to a school. And they established the Washburn School, a little one-room country school. I went to a little one-room country school. I know that makes me old, doesn't it? But I went to a little one-room country school, and Dad, back in the heyday, used to milk 30 cows every morning and every night. And... Fortunately for me, the three older children remember that clearly, but all I remember after that dozen years was when I got old enough to remember, I remember pouring cement to fill that little trough, that little hole behind the cattle where we used to scoop it out. <laughs> I, all I remember is pouring the cement in that and, and having a cement floor there. We had, we had four uh, cows then, and my next older brother occasionally got assigned to do some milking. Uh, usually dad would get up first thing in the morning, and he would milk. And then, uh, times got a little tough on the farm in Michigan. They went through the Depression up there and went through World War II and all those kinds of things. And, and dad got hired at the Owasso Post Office. So he could supplement his income. Still milk in the morning before he went, drove into the post office, and then still milk at night when he got home. <laughs> and uh, so dad, like some of you have mentioned, dad was a worker. He always, always worked. But I want to share one thing with you that, that made a real impression with me. I, the, the little church that, that we went to was in a little town. And the only reason the little town was there is because the railroad went through there and they had a little granary. So all the farmers took all their crops to the granary and that's where they got loaded up. Well, because of that, they had a United States post office there. And they had a grocery store. And they had a five and dime store. And they had a gasoline store. You know, I mean, oh boy, oh boy, you know, this, this big town. And, and to this day, there are still 250 people there if you count all the dogs and cats. <laughs> Dad and mom decided that the number one thing that was most important in this life was our Father in Heaven. That of all the fathers 
that have ever existed. He is not only the most powerful, the wisest, he's also the most tender, the most gentle, the most kind, the most loving of any father anywhere. And because of their commitment that way, oh, mom taught Sunday school, she played the organ and piano for church and all those kinds of things. But because of their commitment, somehow that, that little church there in Henderson, Michigan, decided that dad would be one of the leaders. And as often happens in churches, there came a day, that fateful day, when the church decided that they were going to have a fight. Oh, they drew up sides. And they were going to fight. And, and dad said, okay, I'll, I'll serve as leader. And he was trying his best to help bring things together, to help people to work together, to help people love each other as brothers with the same father in heaven and sisters with the same father in heaven. And he did his best to do that. But the reason that made such an impression on me was not only because he willingly stayed to try to bring things together, not as a preacher, I don't even know that the, who the preacher was back then, but as, as the local leader of the church. I went out to recess one day from our little one-room country school, me and my next older brother, so my younger brother must not have been in school yet, so I was probably only in second grade at the time, but I clearly remember Youngsters from both sides of the church fight coming out for recess and picking up stones and dirt and starting to throw them at me and my brother. We quickly ran and hid in the furrow out there in the field, in dad's field, and they were still throwing it. And, and we'd pick up and throw something back to keep them from getting any closer, you know, because they might hit us. And then the recess bell rang and we all went back in and sat down for our studies. The thing that made the impression on me was... At that moment, I knew that Dad was the local person trying to bring everything together, working hard at bringing everything together. And here I was, his son and my older, next older brother, and both sides had come together to attack us. You need to thank God for Larry Cassidy, and you need to pray for him. Not that you're going through a church fight, but I know a little bit about what it takes for a person to say, okay, I'll try to lead. I'll try to keep things together. I'll try to bring things together. And you know who the best example of that is? Our Father in Heaven. Wow! What a God! What a Father! I can't imagine what it would have been like for my Father down here to pat one of my older brothers on the back and say, okay, I'm going to send you to Korea to defend people and their lives and maybe even give your life for them. I can't imagine what that would have been like. But that is exactly what our Father in Heaven has done for us. He sent not just a son, but His one and only to die for you and me. Wow. Fathers, this morning, can you find it in your heart to love people enough to do that? My wife and I have visited a bunch of different congregations around on different Sundays, and, and we've, we've done different things to speak there, or not to speak there, or to sing there. One time they even asked me to play the organ for them on Sunday, and I didn't know the hymns, and it was a real struggle because our house is too small to have an organ, so I was totally unpracticed and unprepared. But we have found here at Zion that you folks seem to be friendlier and more outreaching than any place that we have visited. And I commend you to God for that. It's always a pleasure for us to get up, even though Rita hates mornings. And when she used to work before she retired, she'd report for work at 9 o'clock and start her business, and then she'd shut her office door and say, if it's not emergency, don't you talk to me till 10. <laughs> 
And she managed the office for Hancock Eye Associates. And, and, and she ran all of the insurance and, and did all of the business and, and took care of all the patients and got them all signed in and, and took care of them. She, she was it. In fact, she even changed light bulbs when one would go out, you know, because she was. But from 9 to 10 in the morning, neither one of the optometrists would even speak to her other than saying, Hi, <laughs> because they knew. But when we set the alarm this morning for 7.30 for her to get up and come out to Zion, she was pleased. She was tickled because of how you are and how you seem to love the Lord God. That brings me to the text of my sermon. Sometimes it's difficult for us to figure out as fathers, what does God really want me to do with my life? What's his will? Wouldn't it be nice if just all of a sudden heaven opened and there was a verse printed in the sky or God himself spoke? Well, I don't know. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, they all got kind of nervous because there was lightning and thunder and anybody that touched the mountain, even cattle were, were restricted. If, if an animal touched the mountain, it would be sown to death. And they knew that. And maybe, maybe we're better off not having God really speak to us because it might be. And they begged, Moses, don't let him talk anymore. He'd only given 10 things. And if you go on the next chapter, you find out he's got chapter upon chapter upon chapter of more instructions to give them to help him understand what those Ten Commandments were and, and how to live them out in the Old Testament and all that. Yeah, we're probably better off without that. But I ran across this passage that tells us what the will of God is. And the will of God is very plainly said there. God wants you to know. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What is this God's will for you in Christ Jesus? Rejoice all the time. Be joyful always. We face some pretty difficult times. We have situations where we get up and it's too early for us and we don't want to be rejoicing. But do you know... According to Ephesians 2.10, God has prepared in advance for you to do things that He wants you to do. God has already prepared in advance for you to be joyful all the time, to rejoice always. God has prepared that for you. What's that mean? That means if God has made it possible for you to do it, and you're not doing it, you got deluded by Satan? You thought that you couldn't rejoice? <laughs> How many of you have ever seen something that made you so stirred in the heart, so happy, so overflowing, that you just wept with joy? Yeah. Yeah. God wants us to be so full of joy that as all of the ministers of Zion Church, like it says in our bulletin, who are the ministers here? Everyone who's a part of this fellowship. God wants you to be so full of joy that people will start looking at you and saying, how can you be joyful when you just lost a spouse or when you just lost a youngster or when, when this is going on or you just were foreclosed on a loan on the bank? And How can you be joyful? Let me see, this is a farming community. We planted seeds, the seeds grew up, and we got the harvest. Well, what's the harvest of the Holy Spirit living inside of us? Oh, the harvest is love and joy and peace. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him. Let him build a love and a joy in you that surpasses understanding. Oh, yeah, it said that about the next one. Love, joy, and peace that surpasses understanding. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and kindness and gentleness. Oh, my. You see, if God has his way with us, we can rejoice always. And we can pray without ceasing. You might say, well, friend, what are you praying about right now? Remember how Jesus said, sometimes you just need to enter into your closet. Sometimes the prayers that I'm offering perhaps right now are prayers that you will never hear. 
Because God hears in secret and He wants us sometimes to enter into private to pray. Yeah. I remember in one church I was ministering to, it happened to be in Kentucky, and, and I lived down there for half a dozen years, got used to not the mountains, but the curves of eastern Kentucky down uh, south of Evansville. <laughs> People ask me where I preach, and I say, well, just south of Evansville, because everybody knows where Evansville is, but how many of you know where Sturgis, Kentucky is? <clears throat> oh, we got some. Yes. Out in the Y community. It was a Y community because two state roads came together right there at, at the bridge that went over the Shawneetown, Illinois. Yeah. We used to have a lot of people swim the river right there just so I could marry them because in Kentucky all they had to do is swim and give me 10 bucks and I'd marry them, you know. <laughs> yeah. It was in Kentucky. It was there that we discovered that we could grow love and joy and peace. And the communi community could begin to see that in the church. They could begin to understand that there's, there's something different about the way people love and the enjoyment they have out of life and they can pray without ceasing. We had one lady in that Kentucky church, every time she heard a siren, she would say, Lord, go with them. She didn't know if it was an ambulance, Lord, go with them. Or if it was a police car, oh, Lord, keep that policeman safe because somebody is, is in trouble, something is going wrong, and Lord, be with them. Or perhaps it was the volunteer fire department. By the way, we put out a fire once down there in Kentucky, Y'all didn't know you got me started on Kentucky, did you? We were out in the country, and, and my, my deceased wife and I, and, and this fellow in the church and his wife, we were out driving through the country, and, and uh, I wonder why he was burning my gas. I wonder why, how why was I driving? Anyway, <clears throat> I mean, I wasn't being paid. In fact, when they hired me at that church, they said, now you realize that we can't afford to pay you. So both you and your wife are going to have to get jobs. So I went to work driving school bus for the whole six and a half, seven years I was there. And my wife worked at Walmart the whole six and a half, seven years. And we had a wonderful ministry. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're fine people. They just were a small church, couldn't afford anything. But anyway, uh, we, we were out driving. My wife said, I think that house was on fire. I said, no, that was a garbage can out back. I saw there was a garbage can out back. And so I thought, oh, that, that's what it must have been. I said, no, no, it wasn't just a puff that came from that direction, there's something burning out there. So we turned around, we went back, and sure enough, the house was on fire. The guy that was with me had worked the volunteer fire department out of Henshaw, Kentucky. Anybody know where Henshaw, Kentucky is? <laughs> Just outside of Sturgis, halfway to the Y. Anyway, he had, he had worked on the, the volunteer fire department. And so, lo and behold, we went rushing back. And, and, and he said, what are we going to do? And we told the women, just drive till you find a phone. This is before cell phones. And so, drive to find a phone and call the fire department. And they'll be out here. So, meanwhile, Sam said, well, I know what to do because I worked on the fire department. And so, he climbed the ladder and had, said, throw me the whole and I threw the hose up there and he started hosing down what looked like the side that was over the kitchen. I don't know what, what caught fire in the kitchen, but there was nobody home. And so here we are hosing this down all of a sudden. He ah! <clears throat> said, shut off the electricity, Fred. <laughs> yeah, he got the water down there enough and got into and And so I said, well, I don't know how to shut it. He said, just pull that meter out there. I said, I've never pulled a meter. He said, just pull it. It'll come. <laughs> so I pulled the meter. And he says, now we've only got a little bit of water pressure left, you know, in the tank. And he sprayed until it was out. And then we sat down and waited. First thing you know, here came the ladies back. I said, we called the fire department. Okay, well, all we can do is wait. When the fire department arrived, they knew exactly where to cut the hole because this guy worked with them. And he said, cut the vent hole there and the fire's in here. And, they, and, you know, and boy, they went right to it as though he was the boss, the man in charge. He wasn't in charge of nothing. But because he loved the way God loved. Because he was joyful the way God was joyful. Because he was full of peace and gentleness and kindness to other people. They just automatically responded to him. We saved the house. We saved the house. Wow. Pray all the time that God will put you in situations where you cannot just save a house, but you can save a soul. Because God has made that possible. 
possible for you to pray that you can accomplish what he wanted you to do. He didn't put us here for no purpose. He clearly said, I want you disciples to go and make disciples everywhere and to teach them everything I just told you. Oh, well, if they were supposed to be teaching us that, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be learning to go, make disciples, and then teaching those people to go and to teach them all the other things. Wow. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks. Someone mentioned the father in the wheelchair. Boy, God, I'm thankful I can still use my arms. <laughs> God, I'm thankful I still got some breath, can still see my children grow. God, I'm thankful in all circumstances. Find something to be thankful for, for this is God's will. Clearly stated there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is God's will. Father in heaven, we pray that you would bless each one of us with a thrill of knowing your will with the attitude that we can be joyful all the time, that we can pray all the time, even in private when people don't know we're praying, that we can keep in contact with you. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to find ways to always be thankful. And Father, for every father that's here, we pray that they might aspire to be the kind of father that you have always been from the beginning of creation. That we might know that we can make things for our children, for our children's children, that are eternal. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 You may be seated. And our special offering for this month is the Mahoning Valley Christian Service Camp. So let's give generously out of God's bounty as living signs of the kingdom of heaven. Let me say just one word about Mahoning Valley. I have served out there as one of the counselors a couple different years, and uh, it is amazing. As Lynn can tell you, this week she's going to serve in a Christian service camp too. It is amazing how young people can begin uh, with all of their frivolousness of life and all the distractions of, of the, the internet and the cell phones and, and all of the music and everything that's going on today. It is amazing how you can take young people and this very week, starting this afternoon, Mahoning Valley has three different camps going on at that site. They've got the regular camp where people will be in the dorms. They've got a short camp where little bitty children are coming for just a day. They've got a, another short camp, which is a little longer, where children come for two days because they're a little older and they spend the night. And then, by the way, because of your generosity, they have been able to build what they call a wilderness camp. And so they have that camp going this week, and people will be going out, the, the young people, and camping in tents away from the main grounds in, in the wooded area out there. 
Uh, I've also had the privilege of mowing the lawn there a few times. And when you start wandering off into those wooded areas, these kids have nothing out there. No TV, no internet, they haven't put their phones away and everything. And I mean, they are coming face to face with the Creator God. Wow! So your special offering to Mahoning Valley and to the young people I know is tremendously appreciated this morning. Thank you. on page 692, Faith of Our Fathers.
pray that you would go with us, that you bless the mission there as they prepare for another week of camp today. And Father, that you go with us, make us the missionaries of this place. That Father, we might share your love, your joy, your peace in a way that this lost and dying world needs today. And it's in Jesus' most precious name that we part. Go with us, Father, in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.